All right, well, welcome back. So this is the second to last lecture uh, for this semester. Um, so we're, today we're gonna be talking about attitude dynamics. So this is a, this is a topic which uh, is sometimes a little bit confusing to students. It, probably still confusing to me at some points, uh, because we're, we have to talk about rotating frames of reference, and that makes, makes life a little bit difficult. Uh, so when, as we go through, uh, try and keep in mind uh, the vectors we define, uh, rotation rates and stuff like that, whether those are in the inertial coordinate system or whether they're in a body fixed coordinate system, a, a coordinate system fixed to the body of the spacecraft. So if, imagine you're in the spacecraft and your spacecraft is tumbling out of control and what do you see versus uh, what does someone say uh, not located there, like on the International Space Station or something? What did they see? So try and keep in mind the, 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 the frames of reference. And we'll try and make it as clear as possible, although, again, no matter what we do, there, there seems to be always some confusion. So this lecture is going to be roughly organized into uh, two parts, right? There's going to be uh, part one, which is Euler's equations. So we're gonna derive Euler's equations, which is gonna be tricky because, right, we haven't talked about attitude dynamics at all yet. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a brief introduction to that, not get into too much depth, but we'll, we'll do our best. Euler's equations. And then two, uh, we'll talk, interpret Euler's equations and talk about the, uh, the, the body fixed versus the inertial frame and how does the uh, rotation vector move in those frames. Right? So I'll just call that application. Uh, and I'll say something application to uh, body cones and stuff. We'll see what that means later. So we'll have two parts and we'll try and take a break in the middle. All right, so uh, what are we gonna cover? Uh, so the, the topic of the lecture is uh, attitude dynamics. So basically we have to derive the equations of motion. Equations of motion. So obviously, when we derive equations of motion, with the normal approach is to, uh, to go back to Newton and ask him how we do things, right? And Newton's uh, laws of motion, right, will give us force uh, equal, F equals ma, right? Here equals ma. Um, we're not going to concentrate on F equals ma, however, too much because we're not interested in linear motion. We're not interested in how the actual, the spacecraft actually moving around in space anymore. We used to, now we're not. Uh, we're going to be focusing on how it rotates. So rigid body dynamics, F equals, F equals ma applied to rigid body dynamics. And as I said, uh, keep in mind your reference frames as we go through. So we'll introduce, we'll start the lecture by reminding us uh, about rotations and coordinate systems and what's a positive rotation and things like that. So we'll go through that real quick. All right. So what's a, what's a positive rotation? Well, we know what positive directions are, right? We define our coordinate system, x, y, and z, using the right-hand rule. Right-hand right rule says you take your first three fingers, uh, your thumb is x, your uh, pointer finger is y, and then the third one is z, your middle finger. Right? So if those are pointing in the directions they naturally go, as opposed to something like weird like that, uh, that is a valid coordinate system, right? x, y, and z. Right? If I put my finger the other direction, right? My pointer finger the other direction, that would not be a valid coordinate system. So coordinate, valid coordinate systems have to be defined. Uh, the positive directions have to be defined using the right-hand rule. That's the basics. Um, likewise, for positive 
rotations, there's also a right-hand rule for positive rotations. It's not quite the same, but it, it does involve using your right hand. So uh, basically, if uh, you have a coordinate, which is your thumb, your thumb, you line your thumb up with one of the coordinates, positive coordinate directions uh, from your previous. Now, obviously, you don't have two right hands, so that makes things a little bit tricky because you got to like, slip your uh, right hand over your pseudo thumb over there. And uh, if you do that, then if your thumb is pointing in the positive direction, then the direction of curl of your fingers gives you a po direction of positive rotation, right? So your paw coordinates pointing that way, positive rotation is, is the curl of your fingers, which is usually defined as uh, counterclockwise. Right. Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise about your thumb is positive or counterclockwise about the rotate the posi the positive direction is uh, is positive right so it's hard to draw in two dimensions but i hope the hopefully you can get the the idea uh, so that's that's what we mean by a positive direction positive rotation and that's going to be important uh, when we talk about um, rotating coordinate systems right <clears throat> Uh, so clockwise, and it's nice that English has such a, a compact way of saying what we mean by right hand uh, positive rotation. And I think in France, it's uh, it, they they try and say it the same way, but uh, but of course they don't have a sort of jargon for it. It's like le même uh, sens de la main de la rouge, the same sense as the hands of the clock or something for clockwise, which is. Uh, somewhat unwieldy. Nice that we have CW and CCW in English. Right. <clears throat> uh, so rotation vectors, well, we talked about them a little bit early on, right? Rotation vectors, when we talked about rotating uh, the coordinate systems for Earth-centered inertial and so on and so forth. But I just wanted to redefine them here a little bit uh, so that we can use our jargon a little bit. Uh, in particular, the roll, pitch, and yaw, right? So uh, these are uh, typically defined for uh, an aircraft dynamics, so we're not going to talk about them too much, right, because this is an aircraft and we're in a spacecraft course. Uh, yet, uh, they, they still somewhat apply. Uh, so in aircraft dynamics, uh, the, uh, the X is typically pointing towards the front. Now, we don't have a front in space, so that makes life a little bit dif difficult. Um, so the front is in aircraft for its X, Z is down, and uh, Y is, uh, is, is, is the third direction, right? So uh, Y is Z down? Well, we don't know, but that's how it is. And so a positive roll direction, right, is a, uh, is a counterclockwise rotation uh, about the X axis. So if you put your, uh, your right hand and you line your thumb up with the X, Right, we see a positive counterclockwise rotation here. Now, again, it, it looks clockwise, but in that that's why we, we try to get away from clockwise. We use the, the hand, right hand rule. Uh, likewise, uh, for the yaw, right, that's a rotation about the Y positive. Yaw means uh, you pitching your aircraft up, right? It's about that axis. And a, uh, oh, sorry, that's a, a, a pitch, right? Not a yaw. Not, uh, take that yaw thing back. Uh, so yaw is about the z-axis. Pitch, I meant a positive pitching moment, a uh, positive pitching rotation is about the, the y-axis. It pitches the, the, the aircraft up, right? And yaw then, uh, uh, sorry about the, the mix-up, the yaw is then about a positive rotation around the z-axis, but now you have to point your thumb down, and that's why a positive rotation goes in that direction. So positivity in the roll, pitch, and yaw. So that's uh, that's important, right? And then of course we extend the the, the notation of positivity to moments and forces as well. So forces, it's easy, right? I mean, positive force in the x direction is in the positive sort of x direction. That's fairly clear. Uh, positive y, positive z. Don't need to talk about these too much, right? Especially since we're not really going to be talking about translational motion of the of the spacecraft, that's that's not really important to us at this point. 
if you're docking or rendezvous or something, it might be, but, but for us, it's not at this point. Uh, more important, of course, is the uh, idea of a positive moment. All right, so we, we, we haven't talked about moments, torques, very much yet. A little bit when we talked about orbital perturbations, but, but not really that much. Uh, and so, again, we have to define the direction of positivity of a moment, right? So a moment, so we have L, M, and N for our, uh, our, our, our moment magnitudes, right? Uh, so what is a positive roll moment, a positive moment about the X uh, direction, right? Well, again, it's the same sense we see here. It's that counterclockwise, which doesn't make much sense. So we prefer to use the right-hand rule. So a positive moment uh, is one that rotates that way about the y-axis pitching moment, positive pitching moment mo pitches you up. And a positive yaw uh, yaws you uh, to the right of this aircraft. I use an aircraft, right, because that is a little bit more of a frame of reference, but. Uh, again, we're going to be mostly dealing with spacecraft. The problem is spacecraft are usually pretty axisymmetric, so it's really you, you have to fix your 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 coordinate systems fairly well. So actually, in space in, in spacecraft, I don't know uh, that typically looks like our x, our z usually looks like that, and our y is just given by the right hand rule. That's for spacecraft. Right. So with those uh, those definitions of positivity in hand, we can uh, we can start to get or start to start to move towards deriving equations of motion. Right. And again, we're going to be using Newton's law. So we'll start with translational motion. Again, we're not very interested in translational motion, but we'll just uh, we'll, we'll 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 talk about it in order to get started, and then we'll move over to rotations very quickly. Right. So of course, F equals ma, right? That's the, the governing equation here. Uh, these are vectors, however, so uh, we should be a little bit more uh, uh, robust in our definitions, right? And so our force is a vector. We, uh, in, uh, in the US, use the uh, little vector hat thing there. Uh, so that's a vector. And uh, it's equal to the mass, right? That's a mass of the of, of a point this is a particle really emphasize that uh, these apply to particles or if you're talking about um, a rigid body then we're talking about motion the mass of the rigid body and motion of the center of mass right so for rigid body it's uh, motion of center of mass Right, well, we don't need to get into it too much. Uh, we'll break the uh, the force components down into three. I guess I should like, make a transpose because we usually write these as vectors. Uh, the velocity then, the rate of change of velocity, uh, F equals M uh, DDT of the rate of change of velocity. So not much complicated there. Break our velocity vector out into three components and we can make this a scale, three scalar equations if we want by decoupling them. Uh, we can define uh, linear momentum, right? Uh, that's just uh, what, you, what you think momentum is, right? And then uh, force is the rate of change of momentum. Force equals the rate of change of momentum, linear momentum. Now, I emphasize uh, that part of Newton's, uh, this is third law, I believe. I can never keep track of which laws are which, but I think this is the third law. Uh, says that uh, this is valid, of course, if all of these vectors, and I want to emphasize their vectors, scalars, it's not, you know, they don't really have coordinate systems for scalars. But if these are vectors, and now we're talking vectors, uh, these equations are valid only in an inertial coordinate system, right? One that isn't accelerating. Uh, it, can, it can be moving. All coordinate systems are really moving. I mean, the Earth is moving, right? So we typically assume that it's it's static um, but it can't be accelerating and if it is accelerating we have to take that into account so the system is inertial if it is not accelerating in here we're going to start talking about rotating uh, there's a different equation of motion uh, 
if you're rotating. Now again, we're not going to talk about the translational motion so much in rotating coordinate systems, and so I don't want to don't want to get sidetracked on that. But uh, it is important we define what we mean by a co inertial coordinate system. Right. So the uh, the classic one is uh, ECF versus ECI. We're not going to be talking about ECF or ECI versus ECEF. We'll talk about uh, body fixed, which is is rotating versus inertial and uh, that inertial coordinate system is, is somewhat loosely defined uh, it can really be well ECI or something attached to an observer or, or something like that but uh, so we're not going to focus on the inertial too much just assume it's a case dependent right. so now we get to the big uh, the big problem uh, which is uh, if we just if we're not if we're talking about motion of not just a particle, we're talking about a rigid body, which is a collection of particles, and it's not just a collection of particles like we had in the n body problem. It's uh, rigid. It's particles which are bound together, right? And so there are lots of internal forces governing these particles, and so that that makes life all sorts of complicated. Right? So, for example. Uh, our, our most basic uh, you know, particle could be, right, we have two point masses, right, and they're connected by a rod, and the rod has zero weight, zero mass, M and M, right? So if you, uh, if you throw the rod up in the air or spin it or move it around or accelerate it, you apply a force here, right, a torque here, something like that, right? There's like lots of internal forces in the rod, but the rod is actually doesn't contribute to dynamics. But that, so those internal forces do govern the motion of those two point masses. Right. So we're not, we don't really play around with rods too much in space. We talk about rigid bodies like these cubes we've been talking about. And here I've gone off the screen to start marking my screen. Um, so how are we going to deal with that? All right, so First, we'll assume that like there are a lot of point masses. And we're going to assume they're not very massive, like infinitesimally small. Okay. And so when we talk about momentum, and remember, uh, F equals MA is really F equals MD, well, D, DT of L, where that's linear momentum. Add some vectors there. Uh, we want to extend that to uh, the entire collection of particles, right? And so we define this concept called angular momentum, right? which applies to rigid bodies, and it's essentially the moment the the integral of the momentum over all of the particles, right? So. This is momentum of a particle. And then we integrate all over all the particles, weighted by how much mass they have. Right? So this is the integral over all particles. So that's how we define angular momentum, is the integral over all of the momentum of all the particles. We call it angular um, for reasons which is obvious, uh, because it, it's going to be affected by rotation. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so, of course, right, if, the, if the, the object is not really moving, right, if we integrate over distance with respect to center of mass, Right, if this particle's moving that way and this particle's moving that way, when you sum the two momentums from those two particles, uh, the sum is going to be zero, right, from those two particles. But, right, the angular momentum of those two particles uh, will not be zero, and so that's what we want to try and capture. All right, so uh, we define angular momentum that that way. Uh, of course, that's uh, uh, completely relatively useless because we don't really want to like be integrating things all the time. 
And so we have a relatively compact formula for uh, the, uh, the angular momentum of a rigid body, assuming that the relative positions of the particles don't change, right? And that that's due to internal forces, which we we're going to like pretty much ignore. Um, so the angular momentum then of a rigid body uh, can be defined as the inertia tensor uh, times, which is a matrix. It can vary with time at this point, right? Uh, times the rotation vector uh, of, the, of the rigid body, which can also change with time. But, so I should really put, up, well, angular momentum doesn't change over time, but, right, unless acted on by an outside force. And so I, I can put this, uh, these, these things as a function of t. So even if this angular momentum vector is conserved, which it is, uh, in the absence of torque, uh, these particular two objects that I've used to define it uh, will change with time. In particular, the inertia tensor, right? If we have a rigid body which is rotating around in space, right? Uh, the inertia tensor for that orientation of the body is different, say, from the, you know, well, it's hard to tell. Inertia tensor, I'll make it sort of oblong, boxy is different from the inertia tensor in that orientation. So even though the body hasn't changed shape, because its orientation has changed, the inertia tensor in inertial space has in inertial space. And that's important. Remember, I told you we, we're gonna have, we're gonna be talking a lot about coordinate systems and how we define things in which coordinate systems. In this formula, right, is in inertial coordinate system, is in the inertial coordinate system, right? So we use a little sub-index i here, right, for a vector which changes a lot with time uh, to indicate it's in the inertial frame. I guess we should actually be adding a little i here to the inertia tensor as well to indicate that this is in also the inertia frame here. I add a little comment in the inertial frame, right? Uh, well, so, Inertia, moment, so mom, the angular momentum, right? We have a formula to define it, but at the current moment in time, it's not very useful. Right. So how, uh, so what's this I that I introduced, right? So this inertia tensor, inertia matrix. Um, well, it's a matrix, right? So we can start with that. Uh, it's, uh, it has nine components as a three by three matrix should. Um, and what are these components? Well, if we sort of draw a, a spacecraft here, it's aggressive. Good. If we draw a spacecraft here, right, uh, let's uh, see what do a spacecraft to look like. I thought it could look like that, maybe something like the Starlink spacecraft. Right. So what is this inertia tensor? So now let's assume uh, here, that we're defining the inertia tensor in the body fixed coordinate system, right? So that we have a uh, x, a y, and a z. Uh, that's not a right-hand coordinate system. I don't think. X, y, z. See, you can figure it. Double check that. That's y hat, x hat. Uh, no, sorry, backwards. Z hat and x hat. Right. So uh, what is this thing, right? So let's assume it's uniform density, right? So we have a dm here to indicate we weight by, you know, the components of mass. But uh, we're going to um, assume it has uniform density for the moment. Um, and so what is this? Well, let's look at the principal moments of inertia, first of all. These, that's these. So those are the principal moments of inertia. That's just because they're xx, yy, and zz, and they're on the diagonal, right? Actually, I shouldn't cross them out. You know, I'll like highlight them with some green here. Right. So those are the principal moments of inertia, and they're going to be most important to us. 
Uh, so what are they? Well, they're basically you integrate over the body, right? And uh, these are essentially weights, these Ys and Zs, weights by how far that particle of mass is from, in this case, the x-axis. So for example, uh, if we took a component of mass here, right, it would have weight uh, in the y, right, that, that y uh, by the distance from the x-axis, and uh, it, it has zero z component, so that would be zero for this, this particular one. Right, it would just be y squared. Um, likewise, if we took a, a little chunk of mass there, right, that would indicate the, uh, the z component because it's in the z direction. Nowhere, however, of course, uh, do we have the distance in the x direction of that point of mass. So this point of mass could be would be equally uh, useful right here or here, even if it was at zero, well, actually, um, zero, zero x value, right? So the, 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 the weight does not depend on x. And that's true for the other principal components of inertia, right? Change color here. Go to something exciting. Uh, the weight doesn't depend on distance from x. Right. Likewise, here, the weight doesn't depend on distance from y. Um, I don't know how, how to write that. Doesn't, I don't want to rewrite all that. Not, I'll just say not y. And here, it doesn't depend on z, not z. Right. So the uh, principal um, moments of inertia uh, the x direction, depends on how far you are away from the x-axis, but it doesn't depend on where you are on the x-axis. Right? So in particular, for, uh, for this, uh, this uh, boxy spacecraft here, um, it would have a relatively high principal moment of uh, inertia with respect to x because there's a lot of mass far from the x, uh, um, uh, rel a relatively reasonable amount of mass far from the x. Although this, this, would, this piece of mass doesn't count very much because it never gets very far from the x-axis. Uh, so the x and the y are, are, are going to be this, more or less the same for this little demonstration here. Now, the z is going to be different, however, because there are lots of pieces of mass far from the z-axis, right? right. The, all these, uh, you can go both directions in the x and the y, and you can get fairly far away from the, the z-axis. Uh, unlike the, uh, uh, I, the principle about x, you, where you never get very far from x going in the z-direction. So let's just uh, go over some examples here. Um, So I need some space. So here we go. Uh, let's keep our coordinate system, same coordinate system, right? X, Z, Y, right? So if we had a, uh, so a barbell shaped spacecraft like that, right? Uh, in this case, right, uh, the, uh, we would get the principal I, Z, Z equals zero. Why is that? Uh, because uh, both of these masses uh, ally um, uh, zero distance from the z-axis, right? So they have zero, neither of these have uh, y components or x components, they only have z components. And so when you go down to i, z, z here, there's no, com no there's no, this is going to be zero, and this is going to be zero. And so the whole i, z, z is zero, right? Now, if we go to uh, the x component, right? How far are you away from the x component? Well, you're this delta way. So the i, x, x component is not going to be zero. 
And if we look at the i, y, y, well, the distance to, to these particles from the y axis is going to be the same as the distance from the x axis. So those two mo oops, sorry, that's what should be y. And so those two principal moments of inertia are going to be the same. So we'll, we'll go over some more examples. I don't think I, I think I maybe have a barbell somewhere else. Now these off diagonal components, right? Uh, they're particularly important, right? Um, but for spacecraft, they tend to be zero. And why is that? Well, it's because here you have the square and here you don't. So if there's a component, there's a, a mass particle say here in the, uh, in the negative uh, Z direction, and there's a particle here in the uh, positive z direction, well, those two are gonna cancel each other out, right? So the, uh, this, there, there's the, the z component from one particle is one, and the, the z component from the other is negative one. Here, the z component from, again, one, negative one. And so when you add those two out, up or integrate, if it's a sort of distributed mass, then they cancel each other out. And so uh, the, the, in this case, the principal moments are going to be zero. The x and the y, both, par all, both particles have zero distance in the x and the y. So that, that's not going to be important. Uh, so in, that, in this particular barbell case, all of these are going to be zero. And we can extend that to, uh, uh, to planes of symmetry. Okay, let's see. Do some erasing here. space for myself, planes of symmetry. So let's, uh, let's think of a plane of symmetry. Uh, let's draw a uh, aircraft, right? Here's some wings, right? Uh, let's call this, uh, I think we call that the X usually. Uh, there's the Z and there's the Y. Now, this aircraft has a plane of symmetry about the xy plane, right? As most aircraft do. Sorry, I'm my bad writing skills. I'm down here in the corner. And what does that mean? Well, if you have symmetry about the xy plane, that means for every particle of mass, um, oh, sorry, xz plane, my bad, xz plane, ah, do this quick, z plane. So for every particle of mass in, uh, in the y direction, there's another equal and opposite particle of mass in the negative y direction. And so those two cancel out. So any of these cross integral terms here for this plane of symmetry, right? Any one that has a y in it, well, that moment of inertia is going to be zero. Right? Because all of the positive y components are going to be canceled by negative y components. Now the xz, we don't have a symmetry in the xz. Uh, in the xy plane, if we did, we could get rid of that one as well. But we don't in the aircraft case. In spacecraft, spacecraft are almost uniformly designed to be more or less have two planes of symmetry. So two planes of symmetry in the xy or the, or the xz. And so if you have a plane of symmetry in the z direction and you have a plane of symmetry in the y direction, right, you can, um, there, you get the, that z cancels out and you get a third. If you have, so if two planes of symmetry, you get all of these are zero. And if you only have one plane of symmetry, you have a single off diagonal term. So in this, uh, in this aircraft example, uh, we have that, um, that zero, that zero, that zero, and that zero. But this one is not. If we had one more plane of symmetry, we could get rid of that term as well. All right, so I hope that helps. Let's go through some examples. Right, just here's uh, some references, right? If you have symmetry about the xy plane, right, then the, one, the ter inertia tensors with the z are zero. If you have inertia around, uh, symmetry around xz, then the ones with y are zero. 
and you have your symmetry about yz, the ones with x are zero. Right? Uh, likewise, that's just the intuition I was trying to give you, right? If the mass is close to the x-axis, then the x principal axis is small. If the mass is close to the y-axis, i y is close, small. If it's close to the z-axis, i z is close, small. So you can sort of get some feeling for right, uh, the moment of inertia of something like this. Uh, it's going to be uh, fairly substantial in the z, i, z, right? because there's lots of mass over here. Uh, I don't know what, let's say it's thin like that. Right? Uh, I, y is going to be small because it nets, never gets very far uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the y direction. And, um, right, it never gets very far from the y. Wait, hold on. Um, comment, comment those out. Right, so the ix is small uh, because uh, uh, you never get very far from the x-axis. So you can only go there and there. Uh, you never get... Well, you do get far from the y-axis in this direction, so i, y is moderate. And z, how far do you get from the z-axis? Well, you get fairly far in that direction. Don't get very far in that direction. So again, i, z is moderate. Okay. So how far you get from the principal axis determines how large that principal component is going to be. Here's some examples, right? Uh, so first of all, let's look at the sphere, right? Spheres are the easiest possible case, although there aren't many spherical spacecraft. There are a few, not very many. Uh, and that's, uh, first of all, it has infinite planes of symmetry. So there's not gonna be any off diagonal terms. Uh, also, all the principal moments are, are, are the same. And that's just because, uh, well, it doesn't matter where you draw your principal components. You could draw them there, there, and it would be exactly the same. So spherical symmetry uh, means that our diagonal elements are going to be the same. There is some weight, however, to them uh, given here. Now let's look at the, uh, the ring. Here uh, what we've got is the z-axis is coming out of the board. So that's z. Uh, there's x and there's y. x, y. So x and y it uh, looks like it, they're going to have to be the same because, I mean, you could draw, so I'll draw my x and y's here and it would, wouldn't change the problem in the slightest. Right? So x, y are going to be the same. Uh, and they're also going to be smaller than the i, z. And why is that? Well, you do get fairly far away from, like this point gets fairly far away from the x-axis, but... Um, you never get very far in this direction, right? In the up direction from the x-axis. So they're all sort of, all the mass is in the x-y plane. So you don't get very far from the x-y plane, right? So you do get far from the x, so it's not zero, but it's not going to be as big as the moment of inertia around z, where all the mass is fairly far from the z-axis. All that mass is, is far in every direction. So this is going to be largest, and these two are going to be moderate. Some other examples. Uh, here's a more spacecrafty looking thing. Uh, the, uh, this, this homogeneous disk, right? And here, right, we've got, let's see, I think we're defining that as Z. Uh, there's X, there's Y. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the major moment of inertia, it's hard to tell, I mean, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it look well. It's gonna. It depends on like how high it is. So let's assume it's not very high. So it's relatively thin, right? right that's h, height. Sorry, that that is h, right? This don't define that. Um, <clears throat> so when h is is moderate, it's not very big. Then there's lots of mass uh, far away from the z-axis. But here, let's move, just move the x and y down here a bit. But the mass never gets very far from that x-y plane, and so 
as before in the in the ring case these are going to be equal because we, we could rotate those axes around it wouldn't change anything and they're not going to be as big as long as a is small h is small And now we get, uh, of course, to the, uh, the, the, the aircraft case. We don't have any aircraft in space, but there is a space shuttle, right? Uh, so again, here's X, uh, there's Z, there's Y, right? And as I said, we have symmetry around the X, Y plane, or X, sorry, X, Z plane, I keep making that mistake. And so our, any component with um, a, uh, a Z in it is going to, be, is going to, to disappear, um, right, as we talked about back here. Uh, sorry, any, sorry, any component with a Y in it is going to disappear. Uh, so that one disappears, that one disappears, that one disappears, and this one disappears. Uh, but there, we keep the components without a Y uh, in, in the formulation. A uh, couple of uh, final more examples. Uh, cube. Cube is interesting because it's uh, it's similar to the um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the sphere, right? Its moment of inertia is almost identical to the sphere. It's the zeros off diagonal, right? Because there's three planes of symmetry here, right? X Y, X Z, and Y Z, right? Three planes of symmetry. And um, it doesn't really matter where we attach our axes, right? We could attach them there, right? But we could also rotate those axes in about any axis by 90 degrees, and it wouldn't change the geometry. And so what we're gonna, we find is that all the principal moments of inertia are the same. Yeah. So the, the, the moment of inertia, the dynamics of a cube, are actually identical to the dynamics of a sphere, right? And that's actually... We don't have many spherical spacecraft, but we do tend to have quite a few cubic ones, right? So identical to the sphere in terms of the Euler equations that we'll come to, uh, the, the, the rotation dynamics. Uh, next, we come along to a box, right? So we have boxes in space, that's fairly common. And, uh, and here we got, uh, we have, uh, here we, we haven't labeled what are A, B, and C here, right? but we can figure them out, right? So this is the mo principle, this is I, X, X, this is I, Y, Y, and this is I, Z, Z, right? So the obvious question is which length is, let's say, B? Well, okay, which length is B? So obviously it's not uh, not it's not in the x direction. It can't be b, right? Because the principal moment of inertia in right in i x about x right doesn't depend on that. So it can't be x. Well, could it be uh, could it be height? Right, b question mark. Well, let's look at these. Uh, so the uh, so it, it doesn't b doesn't factor into right the uh, principal component about y, right? So b doesn't factor into that. Uh, so, uh, so that indicates, right, that, uh, um, right, the part that doesn't matter uh, to i, y, y is b, right? So therefore, b must be the, the length in the y direction. Right, so um, let's see. Actually, I've drawn this rather poorly here. Uh, let's make y actually looking like that. Uh, it's parallel to this direction. Let's see. There's y. That's 90 degrees. So sorry for the little one. So uh, and b does factor into i z. So obviously uh, b can't be the direction the z axis. So uh, we conclude that B is the uh, length in the Y. Uh, likewise, we just look at the part which doesn't show up in X, which is obviously A. And we look at the part which doesn't show up in Z, 
which is obviously C. Right, and so we can label our dimensions of our box based on the coordinates that we've selected. So let's go to some actual spacecraft here, um, and, uh, and let's look at them, right? So here's Cassini. Uh, it has a, here's the inertia tensor. These off-diagonal terms are relatively small compared to the diagonal terms. So, right, real spacecraft are rarely perfectly axisymmetric, and that may be due not just to the geometry, but where the components are located, uh, how much fuel is used up. So real spacecraft tend to not be perfectly symmetric. Uh, so in this case, we've got Cassini here. Uh, so let's try and figure out which are our X and which are our Y and which are our Z directions. Right? So notice that Cassini has some approximate radial symmetry. Wait, have I drawn that right? No, I have not. Some approximate radial symmetry about that axis. So let's draw that axis. Right? So what that indicates is that um, about that axis, right? Uh, it doesn't matter uh, if you draw the x and the y there or you rotate them 90 degrees. Right? So we could say that with, uh, with fair certainty uh, that this is this is going to be our z axis, right? Because, right, these two numbers are approximately equal, right? So what that indicates is that the it doesn't matter wh how we've chosen our x and our y coordinates. We could have chosen them there. We could have chosen them here. It wouldn't make any difference to the geometry, and that shows up uh, in the fact that we can swap those two columns more or less, right? This is like roughly speaking. So we have some symmetry about the z-axis, so we would expect these two to be approximately equal. Uh, and so since these are the two that are equal, right, uh, this, uh, the z-axis is, is this third one right here. And so that's our angle of rotation. It could also be that direction, but we, we just don't know. Uh, likewise here, we've got uh, near Shoemaker, right? And again, we see two planes of symmetry. This one has radial symmetry. This one's has two planes. Uh, practically, you see it makes very little difference, whether you have rotational symmetry or two planes of symmetry. And so most spacecraft are often defined by two planes of symmetry. And so we see more or less the same effect, right? We can see that the symmetry is there, the symmetry is there, and so we can fairly certainly say that the z-axis is in that direction. Right? Which is the x and the y? Well, we just can't tell, right? Because they're more or less the same, and it doesn't matter in the end, I guess. So ix equals iy. And often I'll drop the double subscript just because it becomes cumbersome. Uh, that's New Year's Shoemaker, by the way. It landed on, uh, on that asteroid Eros, which is a fairly famous, rather large asteroid. If you uh, read popular literature, it's a good place for a space station if you spun it up a little bit better. Right. So now we've introduced uh, the moment of inertia tensor. Uh, so, right, remember in inertial space, we define the angular momentum vector as I uh, omega, where this inertia tensor and the angular velocity vector have to be defined in inertial space. So now the problem becomes, however, that in all the cases we've given, the inertia tensor right, has been defined in the body fixed frame not in the inertial frame. So what are we going to do about that? Well, it, uh, that problem, the fact that 
it's easy to define inertia tensors in the body fixed frame and very hard in the inertial frame is basically the core of the all the difficulties we'll, we'll have in this particular lecture. Right. Fortunately, there's a way of getting around it. Right. So in the inertial frame, we've got right Newton's uh, variation of Newton's third law. Uh, but of course, right, we can't figure out what this thing is, right? Because we only have this now in the body fixed frame. So we have body fixed frame, body, body. Well, the, we can we can pick where we define our angular velocity vector. Let's just define. We can find the angular momentum vector in the body fixed frame, but we can't find it in the inertial frame. So what are we going to do? Well, we use this very nice uh, fundamental theorem of uh, rotation or something. I forget what it's called. It's also called the transport theorem, which is more compact, which says that uh, differentiation of a vector in a rotating coordinate system can be translated to the inertial coordinate system right, by, right? by adding additional step. So this is, so if you want the rate of change of angular momentum, which is what we want, h dot, in the inertial frame, well, you can find that by taking h dot in the body fixed frame and adding to it omega, which is the, uh, angular rotation vector, and that can be expressed in either frame, uh, crossed with the vector itself. In here, we're going to say the body fixed frame because we can't find it again in the inertial frame very easily. Right? So this allows us to then set on the left-hand side the sum of the moments, right, equals to rate of change of the angular momentum vector in the inertial frame, which we can then express as the rate of change of angular momentum in the body fixed frame plus the rotation rate crossed with the angular momentum vector in the body fixed frame. Now, this is relatively easy to express. That's equal to I omega body, body. And this is equal to uh, D dt I body omega body. But I, fortunately, or that's why we chose it, in the body fixed frame doesn't change with time. And so we can do I body fixed uh, omega dot in the body. Right. And so we can, uh, we can then express this, uh, this formula and find the equations of motion, uh, which are going to be Euler's equations. So we can express this equals sum of the moments equals um, I body omega dot body plus, and here we're just going to keep it in the body fixed frame, so everything is in the same frame, cross I omega body body. And this is actually Euler's equation. We can state it all ahead of time. Not Euler's equation, Euler's equation. We'll expand it out a little bit though, later. Now this applies, uh, I, I have this general formulation because it applies not just to right, uh, angular momentum, it applies to linear momentum as well, right? If we want to express linear momentum uh, velocities in the body fixed frame, we can do that as well. Again, we're not gonna focus on that, uh, but uh, right. Remember. Again, we do have a slide on it, though. Right. So uh, uh, we we can write uh, the equations of linear motion in the body fixed frame, right? But we're not going to focus on these are these are generally termed kinematics. We'll talk about why they don't matter much. Right. Uh, to differentiate them from dynamics and. You know, kinematics has lots of uh, different usages in various communities, but in here we're going to call them the we call them the kinematics. 
Anyway, so these are the motions. Um, force, right? Velocities, right? These are in the body frame. And then uh, omega cross V, right? Again, these are the body frame. Uh, so this is differentiation with respect to the body. Right. Um, so we can write those down and we see that the sum of the forces, right? Is, uh, is translated to acceleration of these velocities in the body fixed frame, but is coupled through these rotation vectors. Right? However, so if we were doing aircraft dynamics, we would pay a lot of attention to this uh, because the force, aerodynamic forces are naturally expressed right, in the body frame, right? Your wings are in the body frame, lift, acts right perpendicular to the wing drag parallel to the wing lift drag so your aerodynamic forces and you'd have some mo some torque right from your ailerons some torque uh and that would be best expressed in the body fixed frame and we so we in that case we'd have some some coupling between rotation and uh acceleration in the body fixed frame but for spacecraft, we don't have aerodynamic forces. And so these equations that I've given here, uh, we're not going to pay much attention to them, right? So we don't have these coefficient of moments unless we're in the atmosphere. Uh, uh, so if we're in the atmosphere, that's a different story. Unless we're the space shuttle, right? And, or some other space plane. I guess the space shuttle doesn't exist anymore, so we should make, generalize it a little bit. Uh, but again, what you get are some really very complicated, uh, like 16 equations of motion or something ridiculously large like that. Uh, so aircraft dynamics is actually much more complicated than spacecraft dynamics in the attitude. Because these, these rotations and translations are all coupled together. Uh, so there's 12 because there's acceleration. And so acceleration gives you two equations of motion in each coordinate. Uh, so that's six for translation and six for rotation. Anyway, uh, so now we've got uh, equations of motion for rotation. Right. And these are Euler's equations. Well, these aren't Euler's equations. I should take that back. These are not Euler's equations because Euler's equations simplify the problem a little bit. So these are equations of motion just for rotation. And we can, as we saw before, inertia tensor in the body fixed frame, omega dot in the body fixed frame, plus uh, omega, we could keep it consistent, cross I omega, and we'll keep that in the body frame. Okay. All these are vectors. So uh, we just uh, expand that out where there's I there. Uh, uh, that goes there. Uh, this goes here. Uh, let's see, this goes here. And that goes there. Right? And so we expand it out in matrix notation. Uh, we can actually expand this out as a matrix uh, multiplication as well. I think I've got it on the next slide, yeah. So we could actually just, uh, that would be omega Z, uh, negative omega Y, Omega x. We could actually write the whole thing out in uh, in the uh, uh, just in this simple form in terms of matrices, uh, but I haven't, right? Because I don't want to get into it. Uh, for if we if we do stability analysis, and I don't think we'll get to it this year, uh, if we do a controller synthesis stability analysis detumble, uh, then we would want to do that, but we don't really need to. In our case, right, uh, we're gonna we want to get back to our scalars, right? So equal L M N lemon or something. So we just expand out all these like matrix multiplications, right? This comes down here. This like comes down here. We do the cross product again using that matrix multiplication, but I've just expanded it out. And, uh, and shown what you get in the end, right? You get this term times this term, 
this term times that term. So you get something very, very complicated. And so if I ask you to like, even in the torque-free case with that zero, how, what are the, what's the evolution of omega, right? You'd be really struggling to tell me. And satellite makers or sat added, you know, space people, uh, they, they're also intimidated by these kind of equations. And so most spacecraft uh, are designed uh, to have relatively simple um, uh, geometry. So two planes of symmetry. Now, nowadays, of course, if you remember the Starlink uh, spacecraft, uh, they actually didn't have two planes of symmetry. Uh, and so their, their attitude dynamics, I don't know how they're gonna control them well, I guess they do, but... Um, Um, but uh, they, that, that, that complicates the problem significantly. For aircraft, we have two planes of symmetry, right? So let's see what happens uh, when we, uh, we make these assumptions. So we get rid of most of the terms, basically. And get rid of that one, uh, that one. Um, well, in the, uh, in our, in, our in, in the spacecraft case, we can get rid of more, but... Um, That one's okay. Let's see. Right. So we'd have uh, in the aircraft case, we'd have some terms left over, right? Blah blah, and that that would make life difficult for us. Uh, fortunately. Uh, we can also uh, cross out a few term, cross out the remaining terms. So we'll just box those out as well. So all of these terms, because they're zero, right? We just get rid of them. All those terms we get rid of. Oops, too much. All right. And so all we're left with are one, one, two, three terms in the equation. So not that bad. And that simplification is Euler's equations, right? Euler's equations. Where uh, we have on the left, torques applied to the body. Here we have on the right, the dynamics in terms of a body fixed rotation angle or uh, rotation rates. Um, and the important thing to note in this case, right, um, is that even if you set the whole thing equal, you had no torques at all. What was that? Looks like an error or something. Error in PDF annotator. So even if you had that equal to zero, right? Then the even if there's no torque, the air the, the spacecraft is still is still the, the rotation angle, the rotation vector is still moving. So your axis of rotation is still moving, even if there's no torque. Right? So your angle of rotation in body fixed frame still moves around the place, and it also moves around in the in the inertial space as well. Right. Um, note how, in addition, of course, that uh, none of these dynamics, none of Euler's equations, depend on right translational uh, forces. Right? Don't care about translational variables. I seem to be getting some errors here. Uh, those are the kinematics. They depend on the rotation, but not vice versa. So we're going to, we, we have a good motivation for ignoring them. So again, these are Euler's equations, right? Uh, we can sort of, if we have equal to zero on the right-hand side, 
right? We can write down them in terms of the scalars, right? Which maybe like seems a little bit easier. Um, and in the second part of this lecture, we'll talk about uh, what to do with those equations, right? Uh, so in particular, we'll talk about uh, the case where uh, ix equals iy, right? So that this equation becomes zero on the right hand side. So we'll talk about that next. Um, and so I'm going to briefly take a pause, stop recording, and come back in a minute.